Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Daniel Neto. He is Professor of Behavioral Science at Newcastle University, where he is a member of the Cross-Disciplinary Center for Behavior and Evolution. He studies a number of different topics relating to behavior, aging, and well-being. He mainly studies humans, but also sometimes other animals. Dr. Nettle is also the author of several books, most notably Happiness, The Science Behind Your Smile, Personality, What Makes You the Way You Are, and Tyneside Neighborhoods, Deprivation, Social Life, and Social Behavior in One English City. So, Dr. Nettle, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. You're welcome. Okay, great. So the first thing I would like to ask you, and since today we're going to focus our conversation mostly on personality, personality traits, and the biological slash evolutionary basis to them, uh, what is personality from an evolutionary perspective? Uh, well, that's a very good uh, question. Um, I think people, different people have different definitions of personality, but for me, it's just the the basic idea of evolutionary biology, the thing that Darwin spends most of the first half of the origin of, of, of species talking about is variation. It's the fact that individuals are, you know, he spends a lot of time discussing pigeons, how members of the same species are not exactly the same as one another. And of course, from an evolutionary point of view, variation is really important. Um, and that variation is not just in size and shape and color, but it's also in behavior, right? So we know that uh, animals or, or people of the same species in the same environment will behave in, in consistently different ways. So for me, personality is just that, that variation in behavior that exists even when you hold the environment constant and even when you're talking about members of the same species, um, there's still going to be some consistent variation in their behavior. Mm -hmm. So we study personality mainly at a behavioral level, correct? Well, in theory, that's true. I mean, in practice, in humans, we don't really study their behavior very much. And I think that's a problem. So, when, I mean, there's a huge field of research now called animal personality. Um, and that's really about direct observation of behavior. Sometimes just freely occurring behavior and sometimes um, putting the animal in a standardized situation as a scare object and you see how they respond to the object or something in a standardized way. But of course, in humans, we don't do that. We, we just say, well, people know what they're like. We'll give them a questionnaire. And, or sometimes we give the questionnaire to maybe their teacher or their partner or something. Um, and I suppose there's an assumption there that what the data are that those questionnaires produce is somehow comparable to data on behavior. But of course, it's not really data on behavior. Or rather, it's data on the particular behavior of filling in a questionnaire, which is not the same as maybe other behaviors. So that's an interesting problem. When it, when it comes to humans, we sort of think, oh, it's easy in humans because we can just ask people. But when you ask people, do they tell you what they would really do? We don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the first question, you referred to the importance of variability in selection yeah. and biology. So yeah. wh why would natural selection produce uh, uh, inter-individual variability in terms of behavior? Is it because since the same species might be put under different environmental circumstances, it would be favorable for uh, individuals to have different different behavioral strategies because in some environments some of them might be more advantageous and in other environments perhaps others might be advantageous and or something like that well i think you're you're you're, you're in the right area i think it, i think there's a slightly better way to think about it which mm -hmm. is not so much that um selection actively favors variability it's that selection fails to remove variability. So these are two slightly different things, right? So when selection is very strong and very consistent, mm -hmm. it, it, it's a force that re reduces variation, right? Think about variation in the number of hearts that people have. There is none. And that's because it's very good to have exactly one heart and it's not very good to have two or none. So um, selection is generally a force for homogeneity, actually, when it's consistent. 
But selection is always working against a headwind of environmental fluctuation. So maybe selection is, is not consistent and also population processes. So there might be things like frequency dependent selection where it's good to be male as long as most of the population is female and it's good to be female as long as both the, most of the population is male. So you end up with a mixture of the two. So I think rather than well, we can be a bit naive sometimes in saying that there's been selection for variability. Um, if you mean genetic variation by that. And I think it would probably be better to say that there are various scenarios where selection doesn't remove variability. And of course, the simplest of those is simply neutrality. Um, perhaps within certain kind of broad, broad uh, boundaries, it's about equally good for your survival of, uh, on average to be slightly bolder or, or slightly, um, slightly more cautious. There, there might just be... Um, you know, pro costs and benefits to both of those. And if if the balance of those averaged across environments and across time is roughly equal, then actually there's quite a lot of scope for variation to persist. Also, and we noticed so far we've talked entirely as if variation was always based on genetic variation, but there's also plasticity, which is, mm -hmm. um, which is very important in this, which is that individuals who have different developmental histories um, end up with different uh, different behavioral phenotypes just you know because they've they've responded to, to the forces in that environment mm -hmm. and should we also add to the picture something like behavioral flexibility in the sense that perhaps we have some dominant personality traits in each person but perhaps different people have have varying degrees of behavioral flexibility or, or not well Yes, I'm, I'm sure that's right. And in a way, the fact that we study human personality with questionnaires sort of it doesn't help us get at that, right? Because the questionnaires say things like, you know, are you um, in general, are you a nervous person or are you the kind of person who will do this? And of course, what, what, they're, what those questionnaires are asking you to do is kind of average across all of the various situations you find yourself in. So, of course, what those questionnaires recover is that people are very consistent. But um, you might get a very different picture if you instead actually measured behavior, you know, on a day you have to chair a meeting because that's your job versus a day that you're just hanging out with friends or, you know, these different kind of situations. Um, so how flexible are people? It's a little hard to tell because the way we measure personality almost by definition averages out the situation and kind of says well averaged across all situations are you a nervous person um, and, and so that tends to produce the kind of idea in personality psychology that people are actually very consistent and they don't change but if you really study behavior in context I mean what you'd see is that the the best predictor of how anxious you are is whether you're being chased by somebody you know that the situational thing uh, if you see the same person across many situations, you see there's a lot of variability um, within the individual. So I think the way we measure it slightly determines how we end up, um, how we end up concluding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, these are very difficult topics because when it comes to the environmental or contextual side of things, I've already spoken on my channel with people like, for example, Dr. Robert Plomin, and yeah. from behavioral genetics, we know that personality traits, at least the big five, are roughly 50% heritable and the yeah. other 50% uh, is due to environmental factors, some shared, uh, some coming from the shared environment and the others from the non-shared environment. But I mean, it is very, very difficult to really control and isolate environmental influences on behavior, correct? Well, that's true. But when you think of those heritability studies, what are they actually measuring the heritability of? Um, and it's some very broad uh, kind of scale that says, do you usually behave in this way? And I think what, what, when people answer a scale like that, they implicitly, com they implicitly average across situations and they implicitly compare themselves to other people. So that, you know, when I think, well, how do I answer this question? Am I a nervous person? Well, I compare myself to people I know, like my brothers and other people like that. So um, it, it almost the, measuring the personality in that way 
almost necessarily makes you focus on the things that are very consistent because that's how people answer the question they they think about you know themselves across a broad range of situations and they kind of average across but if we studied behavior in an observational way um i'm prepared to bet that if i put you in a dangerous environment where you didn't know anybody and it was a bit dark you'd behave differently than if i put you in you know in your house and um that would be a very reliable effect that um it would be nothing to do with your genes your genes wouldn't have changed it was just your context had changed but when you use these broad brush measures we like to use in psychology you don't see those those changes um so, so much so i think it's so there's this idea of a norm of reaction which is that uh, every individual changes their behavior across situations so if you can imagine a, a list of situations uh, along a, a vertical axis and then your behavior would be going up and down according to them but the shape but we each have a characteristic shape of of how we vary across those situations right so if you gave everyone the same standard 10 situations there'd be some people will be a bit higher in, 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 in some behavior on the first one and some will be lower. And I think the thing that's heritable might be the shape of that reaction norm. But the thing that determines your behavior on a moment to moment thing is which one of those situations you're in. So both are sort of true at the same time. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the personality traits uh, nowadays, I guess that the inventory that people use the most in research is the big five, correct? But uh, in terms of those... Oh, I lost you, Ricardo. Right. Oh, uh, I, was, I was saying that in terms of personality traits, I guess that nowadays in personality research, the, invent the inventory that people use the most is the big five, correct? But I mean, when it comes to those, pers those five personality traits, uh, what, are, what are, are we trying to get at with them? I mean, do they uh, encapsulate all that there is to know about personality or do they refer to perhaps the personality traits that have the most impact uh, on people's lives for example well that's an interesting question i mean they, they sort of the, the origin of the big five is actually very interesting it's it, the origins of it is lexical so it's what kind of um adjectives or descriptions of people do the languages of the world what distinctions do we make most common and we make we make distinctions between kind of um, uh, um, outgoing, happy people and shy, reserved people, and we make distinctions between anxious people and calm people. And um, the fact that the origins of these concepts are in human languages sort of suggests that what we're trying to capture with these big five is the things that human beings want to know about each other, right? If you want to know am I going to go into business with this person or am I going to go on a holiday with this person? You want to know, are they nice? You know, and uh, um, are they very anxious? Are they very quiet? These are, these are the kind of things you want to know. And so I don't think the big five captures everything and, and it's just a sort of descriptive framework. But uh, in a way, these are the sort of the first five broad brush things that you want to know about someone. You know, are they creative? Are they anxious? Are they nice to others? These kinds of things. And um, once you know those, you know a lot. Of course, you don't know all the idiosyncrasies and, and the particular um, characteristic behaviors, but you have, a, you, you have something of an idea about that person. Uh, and I think that's why it's been such a useful framework for psychologists. Not that it answers every question, of course, but it's sort of um, a useful broad brush way of describing people. Mm -hmm. Okay, and could you please uh, pick perhaps w two or three of the big five personality traits and explain what is the evolutionary rationale behind them? Uh, and I guess that the question is, why did these personality traits uh, evolve? I think the right way to think about that is that... Um, Underlying each personality dimension is variation. Uh, we've already discussed that. And it has to be variation in something. And I think what it's variation is in is some important brain system. So to give you the, perhaps the clearest example, um, well, the, the clearest two examples, uh, we know that 
that in the mammalian brain is something called the reward system mm -hmm. and it responds to food and it responds to sex and it responds to other kinds of social rewards and to money in humans um, and this is a sort of very general purpose uh, system whose function seems to be to motivate you to approach certain kinds of experiences uh, or, or, or stimuli and basically everything we know about extroversion can really be re related to the idea that that system is just a little bit more active in some people than, than others, right? So why do some people want to be the limelight? They want to have money. They want to have attention. They, they really, you know, they really like having sex with new people or whatever it might be. It's because those, they get a big response from that reward system. And other people, they would find those experiences rewarding, but they're, you know, it's a less, it's less of a big response. And so they don't seek those, those experiences quite so strongly. So I think extroversion is to do with reward. Um, neuroticism, which is perhaps the most important single dimension in many ways, is to do with the opposite. It's to do with threat, right? We also have brain systems to do with the d detection of threat. Um, threats can be in the environment, you know, nasty things coming towards you, but they can also be situations you fail to resolve or social things that are going wrong. And again, some of us are very calm and, you know, we recognize threats, but, but the, the response from our threat detection system is mild. And for other people, it's it's huge, you know, and those are the people who are vulnerable to anxiety disorders and depression. And I think what neuroticism is measured is measuring is how active is that system. So the way I like to explain them, and I think it works for several, maybe not all of the big five, is to say, what's a brain system we know about, like reward, like threat detection, and say, well, this this dimension is just variation in the in the responsiveness of that system. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you just refer to brain systems associated with each of the uh, big five personality traits. So uh, I've read in one of your books that we know that, for example, conscientiousness is associated or correlated with activity in areas like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the orbitofrontal orbital cortex. Do we already have all of the brain areas that are correlated with each of the traits mapped or not? Um, I mean, that work is going on all the time. And actually, um, although it's a very simplistic view of the world, uh, of the brain, to suggest that, you know, there's an area that does everything. Mm -hmm. The brain doesn't really sure. work quite like that. But, but actually, having said that, I'm really quite struck how uh, in neuroscience studies these days, there are quite strong correlations between um, the density or activity of certain neural structures um, like the amygdala, uh, like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and and traits measured by a questionnaire, which is such a different methodology that really you you'd think the measurement error alone would mean that they wouldn't correlate well. But actually, it's surprising how well they do correlate in some studies. So. That work is absolutely going on. I mean, I think the one that's intriguing from that point of view is openness to experience, because um, I mean, this is the most obscure of the big five uh, personality traits. And whatever it means, it, it, it almost defies reduction to one brain area because it's sort of the characteristic things are being very creative, making unusual associations of ideas. And almost by definition, you couldn't have a brain area whose function was to make unusual associations of ideas it's a whole brain kind of um, property so I think I think openness to experience is the one that least well fits this idea of there's one brain system and then we can map where it where it is and always remember as well that these neuroscience studies whether they're based on brain damage or on uh, brain imaging mm -hmm. it's not it's often presented as oh well when you think about money it's the um you know uh, the amygdala that lights up or you know uh, whatever um it's not that it's usually the way these studies are designed is that you have you have a condition where you think about money and a condition where you think about some some control thing and you subtract the brain activity in the two so what that actually means is when you're thinking about the money lots of your brain is lighting up but the lovely diagram that just shows a little bit a little area lighting up is the result of subtracting out Mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of other control conditions to try and isolate what's the bit that's differentially active in the money condition. But with that caveat, 
yes, we are beginning to get there, I think, with the brain science. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and is there any way for us to say that there is, for example, a person uh, have reached some high degree of it or very low degree, that it, re it is really disadvantageous to them regardless of the circumstances? Like, for example, I don't know, uh, very high neuroticism that is associated yeah. with depression and anxiety and things like that. Well, that's a really interesting question because it raises the issue of what you mean by disadvantageous, I suppose. Um, it's very clear that high neuroticism is very unpleasant for people. I mean, it's really a tremendous source of humus, human suffering because the whole point about your threat detection system is, is they're subjectively unpleasant, they're aversive. So um, if by disadvantageous you mean disadvantageous to having a happy life, then definitely right, being high in neuroticism uh, is disadvantageous. But there are other things you could mean by disadvantageous. So there's quite a lot of evidence that at least a moderate degree of neuroticism uh, is advantageous in certain professions. Academia probably is one of them, other professional kinds of jobs, simply because you need to be very... Um, focused on the bad things that might happen, checking the details, taking precautions, <laughs> you know, a whole load of things that, that, that are quite useful to do. So um, certainly a moderate degree is, um, you know, is, is probably advantageous if you define advantage in that way. And then, of course, still another thing is evolutionary fitness or reproductive success. And I'm not going to talk about that. Um, in modern environments, we're so far from... Um, traditional societies that it's hard to speculate about how you know whether the same things maximize reproductive success that was true in, in the past but um i just to point out that that personal um emotional well-being success on conventional criteria like jobs and evolutionary fitness are all th three completely different things that <clears throat> excuse me may or may not relate having said all that when neuroticism is very high, something that can happen is people can stop being able to cope. And that's where it becomes not just subclinical depression and anxiety, but it becomes, uh, you know, uh, sort of what we would call um, a psychiatric disorder. And of course, you know, I think there's no question that having episodes of, of, of um, you know, clinical psychiatric disorder are very bad for life in lots of ways, not just, you know, the obvious suffering, but also the consequences they have for what happens to you later uh, and for your physical health are, are very bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, because even some things that people go through, like depression, they can even change uh, the brain itself, like, uh, right, like it's functioning and perhaps even some of its areas, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying something correct here. Or well, not. and I think you are, but it's very hard, actually, to um, distinguish between the kinds of brain differences that might have made you vulnerable to the depression in the first place right. from the effects of the depression, right? So you can't really do a true experiment there. Um, but I think you're right. And I think the other thing that we're learning um, actually is that uh, uh, things like depression uh, have quite adverse implications for physical health in the long term and for aging. I think if you spend a lot of your you know, life having serious depression, it's... Uh, it accelerates aging and, and, and kind of physical deterioration as well. And of course, it's very hard to unpick exactly what's causing what in, in such a situation. But uh, uh, certainly that, you know, the, the indications are bad, I think. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point there, you referred to reproductive success. And I, I know that uh, uh, some years ago, you did a couple of studies with Alan Clegg, where you compared the reproductive success between, uh, for example, creative professionals and non-creative people. And, yeah. then, and then as a follow-up, you compared the most successful uh, creative people w to the least successful ones. So right. uh, th yeah. th does, does that still uh, hold any water or not? Since you referred to reproductive success, uh, that if we analyze it nowadays, perhaps there are some, I don't know, confounding factors or... Well, uh, we, what we analysed was actually mating success, which of course oh, is not okay, the same. Okay, okay, uh, okay. 
and um, which, which is not the same because um, you can mate with many people and still end up with zero reproductive success in, in, potentially. I think mating success is interesting and I think it's interesting because it tells us not because mating success translates into reproductive success in modern societies, it usually doesn't, or you know, doesn't in a simple way. But um, on the other hand, it tells you something about kind of supply and demand for particular characteristics. Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that people are people are very drawn to creative people and and uh, find them very fascinating and you know want to spend time with them and you know find them attractive and so on. I think that might be telling us something. I'm not saying that reproductive success or mating success in Britain in 2019 tells you anything about human evolution, but it, it tells you something about, about human psychology in that, you know, there's a kind of a real interest and excitement surrounds creative people. Um, then, uh, uh, sorry, I just got a message on my phone, not to get rid of, um, that, uh, um, you know, that's telling you something about psychology and that has implications for um for societies over the course of of, of human evolution mm -hmm. and does it tell us anything about uh, processes of sexual selection and how sexual selection works for men and women even from uh, an evolutionary perspective and not only referring to our modern current circumstances let's say well, so I mean, the, I think it does. I think at least is at least suggestive. Um, you need cross-cultural evidence, of course, because it's it's a fallacy to just assume that oh well, what I, what I see in in Britain is going to just hold because that that absolutely you know can't be guaranteed to be the case. But it's at least suggestive, and I always feel with research, um, it's important not to generalise in a facile way. Uh, um, from this population to others because things may be different. But on the other hand, uh, there is a kind of uniformitarian assumption. This is the population I live in, so if I discover things in that, that's interesting and it may or may not generalise, but, it, you know, in a way the burden of proof is almost showing that it doesn't generalise. Um, so I, I think it is, in, it is potentially informative about past processes of sexual selection. And in fact, perhaps in some ways, modern societies are particularly informative because a lot of the constraints are off, right? That uh, maybe in a small village that we might have lived in, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, you just wouldn't have met many different people. <laughs> so you'd have to just mate with the, you know, the person who, who lived next door. Um, and of course, there might have been e very strong economic constraints on who you could sort with. There might have been very strong um, you know, constraints from parental control and things like that. So in a way, modern societies are really interesting because they're a kind of laboratory with a lot of the constraints removed. The economic ones are removed. The pool of people you meet is very large. So any kind of processes to do with attraction, similarity, personality, diversity, uh, you're really going to see them happening, actually, because um, precisely because there's, there's a big pool of people all interacting in a very free way. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to comparative analysis, let's say, comparing different cultures or, or even societies that are structured differently, like, for example, our modern industrial societies and s more traditional ones like the hunter-gatherers or the horticulturalists and things like that, uh, I, I mean, isn't it also the case that sometimes we have to be a bit cautious because even people that live as hunter-gatherers, for example, we cannot be 100% sure that nowadays they still live in environmental circumstances that are similar to the ones in which we evolved and that they have not been influenced at all by people from other cultures like, like us, right? Absolutely. And um, I mean, you're, you're completely right. And we shouldn't take any group uh, uh, as, as somehow representative of the Ur human, you know, the original human society, because probably the main thing you can say about the original human society is that um, it was diverse. <laughs> but, um, humans were hunter gatherers in many different parts of the planet, no doubt under variable circumstances and under different ecological constraints. With, with probably different demographies as well. So um, 
what we shouldn't do is sort of say, well, this society over here, that's a natural human society. That's what human societies yeah, over evolutionary time have been like, whereas this one is artificial. I think they're all natural human societies. They're all within the range of what humans are capable of creating. So really what we need to do is understand the processes that go on in all of them. And of course, particularly understand, <clears throat> excuse me, that, um, you know, try and understand commonalities, common patterns, uh, common, common processes that, that kind of crop up again and again. I think what we shouldn't do is sort of um, variation between cultures undoubtedly exists. But for me, it's it, it's not um, it, it is the phenomenon to be explained. It, we don't just say, oh, well, you can't count those people They're They're not. Proper, you know, they're just weird people or, or, or something. On the contrary, they're still people, right? They're still humans, they're still wired up in the same way. But for some reason to do with the context in which they're interacting, the result is different. But you still need a, a comprehensive theory of human behavior that can account for both why those people over there ended up behaving one way and why and those people over there ended up um, behaving another way. So rather than saying these are, you know, genuine bona fide humans and these are just some sort of cultural artifact, we need to say, well, all human societies need explaining, and they need explaining from the properties of humans uh, and the way they interact and the context in which they interact. Mm -hmm. Yes, and with that in mind, I would like to make a quotation from one of your books, Personality, What Makes Us Who We Are, because I think that this is very important for us to understand not only what you've just explained there, but also when earlier in the interview we were talking about behavioral genetics and genetics and the environment and things like that. So uh, at a certain point in that book you say, when we think about environmental influences, then we need to remember that adults form adult form, sorry, can only be influenced by environment to the extent that there is an evolved mechanism to map that specific cue to that specific outcome. And there will be only an evolved mechanism where the cue is a good predictor that the form will be useful. So could you explain the, this, this quote? Yes, and I think re hearing you read it, I think I've, it's a little too strong what I say there. I, I, I don't think I entirely would put it like that now. But people often make the mistake that um, uh, somehow you only need evolution uh, for cases where the phenotype is fixed. So we need evolution to explain why we have five fingers or something. But where the phenotype is variable, like um, you know the language you speak, which could be English or could be Portuguese, um, somehow evolution doesn't explain that because that's explained by something called culture or learning or whatever. But I think what I was trying to do in that quote is to say, well, culture or learning re require evolved mechanisms. The fact that you can acquire Portuguese and I can acquire English um, is exactly because there are mechanisms in our brain that make all all humans responsive to the in, the linguistic input around them. Okay, so um, the existence of 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 plastic variation doesn't disprove that evolved mechanisms are, are are involved. Actually, on the contrary, it says there must be evolved mechanisms that not only deliver a phenotype but somehow integrate environmental information. Now, I think my my quote was too strong because it implied. If you read what I wrote there, it sort of implies that all of the possible phenotypes are all sitting there inside you and uh, a bit like a jukebox, you know, and all that all that the environment to do is say, oh, I'll have number B3, please, because it's sunny here or whatever. And in phenotype B3 comes out and that that's a disservice to development. It's a bit more complicated than that. But nonetheless, I think that the idea is valid that um, where you have plasticity, um, it's because environmental inputs interact with evolved developmental systems and it's those through that interaction that, that phenotypes are produced. Mm -hmm. So do you think that we could say that whatever the environmental cues that we process or the environmental influences that we get they have to uh, they have to be processed always by some sort of biological system and so the effects that they have 
at the psychological level are always biologically mediated or something like that? Well, yes, I think we have to believe that if we believe in if we believe in naturalism, which is the fact that what we consist in is just these bodies and these brains, um, amazing as that may seem, then I think we're sort of forced to believe that because I don't <clears throat> I don't know of any other causal pathway via which culture or experience or learning could influence me other than via some sort of biological mechanism. Now, I think that the the difficult issue is um, that so a, a difficult issue is where is the information coming from? And I, 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 I think that's that's an area where we don't have good theories because um, in the analogy I gave you before that, you know, there's all these phenotypes sitting inside you and the environment just says it needs to be this one. In that analogy, all of the information was sort of already present in, in you genetically and the environment just had to draw it out. Whereas in practice, if you think about something like a learning a language, the capacity to learn a language, um, uh, uh, you know, is undoubtedly arises from the kind of brain you have, which is to do with the kind of genome you have. But actually, a lot of the information about how you speak English is not in you. I mean, it somehow gets in you. So it's the environment's doing a bit more than just giving you cues. It's giving you a context in which you develop skills. And um, in the development of skills, you actually sort of take in and create and generalize information and i think we don't have we don't have good metaphors for how that works right i mean we're not like empty vessels that the environment fills up but nor are we like i've got all six thousand human languages present in me and the environment just needs to press the button for the one it wants we need another metaphor which is neither of those things i think Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that in mind, could we say then that when it comes to personality and personality traits, that uh, the reason why this the same environment affects different people in different ways is always due to that, to the fact that people are biologically predisposed, at least to some extent, to process the same environmental influences and cues in different ways? I think that's part of it, um, absolutely. I mean, another thing is that development is a sequential process, right? So um, uh, the way I respond to something that happens when I'm 15 might be different to the way you responded because what happened when I was five was different from what happened to you or what happened when I was in the womb was different, you know, and it, if you believe in epigenetics, then maybe even what happened in the previous generation was different. So um, development is, you know, because it's a sequential process, you can actually end up with very different trajectories through it, even if, you know, a lot of the inputs are the same and you know, a lot of the genes are the same and so on. And of course, let's not, let's not affect the, forget the role of chance. Uh, chance is very important in, in development. Um, uh, this is a very sort of complex uh, stochastic process and if you if you run it twice you know especially because the environment is, is varying you wouldn't necessarily get exactly the same result so I think you're you're right um, in a way but it's um, when when we say yes you know you respond to a situation differently than I do because your biology is different that's not just your genes it's your whole developmental history and right back to you know to the womb um, and so the, the kind of net result of that is that you're now set up to respond rather differently to some particular stimulus th than I would. Mm -hmm. And uh, do we already have any really solid evidence uh, as to e if and why people change some of their personality traits during their lifetime? Because, I, I mean, people tend to associate, for example, older people with them being uh, more conscientious than mm -hmm. younger people and less open to experience and things like that. I yeah. mean, do, uh, is, is that already proven in some way or another? Well, it's a bit complicated because there are different kinds of stability, right? So um, personality is often about, personality research is often about um, uh, uh, sort of relative relativity, right? So it's not about our absolute levels of anxiety. It's the fact that I'm more anxious than you. And um, therefore, as we get older, we all get less anxious, actually, as we get older. And, um, and we get more contented with life. But 
it could still be the case that when we're 20, you know, I'm more anxious than you. And when we're 50, I'm still more anxious than you. It's just both of us have moved. So there's, in personality psychology, there's lots of change like that. Uh, people become uh, calmer. They become less aggressive. They become more accepting of their life. Um, they become perhaps a bit more conscientious. I don't know whether they become more or less open to experience. It's an interesting question. Um, but lots of things change. However, uh, I think what personality psychologists would want to say is that the rank order is often preserved. So even when we're 75 and both of us is much less anxious, um, you know, I might still be more anxious than you, even though we've both come down. So uh, I think the evidence for sort of rank order stability is, um, is quite high. The evidence for absolute changes uh, with age is also high. But then you've also got to throw in another thing, which is... Um, People really do change. Uh, people do change what, what what they do. But I think a lot of that has probably got to be attributed to them um, changing the situations in which they exist. So just to take you an example, um, let's say I find my job terribly stressful, so I'm anxious all the time. I could give up my job and do a less challenging job. And then you'd find I probably was much less anxious. And you say, gosh, this person's completely changed their personality. Well, of course they haven't, because my propensity to be anxious in a very challenging situation might be exactly the same as it's always been. I've just changed the situation. So um, people changing and their situation changing is not quite the same thing. Mm -hmm. And do we already have any good evolutionary explanation as to why people would change in those ways as they age? Let's say, for example, uh, would there be, uh, would it make sense to say or to suggest that perhaps as people age, it would make sense from an evolutionary perspective for them to change some of their personality traits in predictable ways because uh, they would fulfill different roles mm. in their in their lives in their families in their societies mm. and things like that yeah i think that's right i mean perhaps the perhaps the clearest example of that is the so-called young male syndrome so i mean people men are um uh enormously or well, typically more competitive and, and more um, uh, aggressive um, and uh, you know more interested in uh, in sort of um, meeting new sexual partners and things when they're younger than about 40 um, and, and uh, over the, older than about 18 and um, you know this has a whole load of societal con consequences and consequences for behavior and it it sort of makes sense right this is the period of peak reproductive competition it's a period where you probably wouldn't have any sons yet who were um, themselves reproductively active um uh, but but so so you know that's a sort of an issue will be occupying and then you know men past that age find a different niche and there are a number of sort of changes that go on in their lives and i think you could find equivalent things for women as well it's not just a, a, a male thing so so absolutely uh, i think that um you know the sort of uh the, the the early in your life you know life satisfaction is an interesting one so people are most satisfied with their lives at the beginning and the end of their lives and there's a long period in the middle which is a bit dodgy and uh, and i think well a lot of that is because in the middle period of life you're trying to find out what you can achieve here and what you know you're sort of working for status and struggling for competition and trying to sort of find a, a niche and you get to a certain point and you realize well whatever niche i've found you know that's that's it now um uh, but, so it would sort of make sense that there was this period during which people were more sort of ambitious and um, more actively engaged in certain types of things. And then their concerns change and they often become um, more focused on their family or their community or something later in their life. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to personality, can we already say or do we have enough evidence to say that, for example, if a particular person has certain personality traits that perhaps some kinds of activities and professional occupations would bring more life satisfaction to them? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think in a way this is something we've always known. In in a way, I think that's something we've always known, right? I mean, anyone, you know, you can 
just think about the people you know you can say well that you know that person would never be satisfied with the job that was the same year in year out and that person would uh, um uh, you know wouldn't be happy working quietly in a library on their own they would need more social contact and so on so i think we can say that i suppose um can we really say anything that's surprising so something i think about psychology you also need to ask yourself is that may be true but is it surprising and it, i mean in a way the fact that we assess personality with questionnaires like would you be happy sitting on your own all day and then we make the amazing discovery that people who answer that they wouldn't don't like jobs where they sit on their own all day and you think well that's true <laughs> it's not hugely surprising is it because you have basically asked them something and you know it just shows that people kind of know something about themselves but um I think for me, the liberating thing about writing about personality was to realize you don't have to stick yourself in the box that everyone else is trying to get into. So you don't have to say, well, just because everyone's trying to make a lot of money, I, I need to make a lot of money too. Or just because everyone else wants to work nine to five, if I don't want to do that, I don't have to. And, and sort of understanding that the naturalness of variation was very sort of therapeutic to me because it made me feel it's okay, you know, people are different, right? And and I don't think anyone gets to the end of their life and says, oh, I wish I'd been more like everybody else. <laughs> or what they probably say is, you know, I made the decisions I made because I was trying to find something, a niche that suited me. And I think that's, yeah, that's a good sort of maxim to live by. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I, I mean, with personality vari variation, we really learn that it is very difficult for us to really uh, set uh, a, a, a sort of philosophy of life that would really suit all people. Yeah, right? absolutely. And actually, I mean, I, you know, I, th I think um, I think this has enormous implications. Uh, just think about something like politics, right? We have very different. Um, we have a great diversity of things that we want out of life and things that we value. And, uh, you know, if you think of politics as the kind of search for solutions that to, to, to people's quest for a life that they value, um, you have this sort of, you know, it's a difficult business precisely because people value different things. And uh, also because the things that some people value come at the direct expense of things that other people value. So some people like getting from A to B very fast and some people like the world to be quiet. And, uh, you know, that's fine. I mean, of course, the basic liberal position is, you know, each of those should be able to have that as long as it doesn't affect the other. But the problem is it does affect the other because if I buy a huge loud motorbike, it affects all of the people who want to be quiet. So uh, for me, it's, you know, I think I think this whole personality stuff is very relevant to politics because it's about, you know, some people are more concerned to get more stuff and the potential rewards. Some people are concerned about potential threats and potential bad things. Some people just want really good social relationships and don't really mind, you know, being materially poorer. Uh, so some people and so on. And so you're actually finding political systems that kind of allow people the liberty to pursue those different goals, but also solve the problem that you know, we've all got to live in the same space and one of us pursuing one goal is, is, has implications for people pursuing a different goal, perhaps. Yes, and it also allows for us to better understand, uh, I mean, b through personality variation, why people value different things and why also it is very difficult for us with our particular personalities to understand what goes yeah. around in people's minds that have personalities that perhaps, even if they are not opposite to ours, at least very different, right? That's right. And I think that, um, I, I mean, often we just, the, the basic the basic failure, for example, if you think about people who have very different politics from yourself, it's not so much that you've extensively reasoned through all the arguments and you can see, you know, that there's a flaw in their argument in step 13. It's more than just that's not what you know. That's not just not what you're you're into, and uh, you know uh, um, that's just not what sort of um, moves you, or or you immediately feel drawn to. And you know, some people get very aggravated about issues that I don't really care about, but then r r refuse to respond to things that seem to me to be much more compelling. So um, 
I think, you know, it, th this idea that there is variation, you know, there's heterogeneity, is very important for understanding how societies work, because I think societies don't come up with, they don't really come up with optimal solutions. Um, to some extent, they come up with the solution that most people are allowed to, you know, will allow to persist. <laughs> so, so, so rather than, it's not that we can find something that we all want, it's that we can sort of find the thing that fewest of us are really upset about, <laughs> and, and then society sort of bump along towards that. And not that that always works very well, by the way, it doesn't, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And do you think that if we were to teach these sorts of things to uh, people in general, that perhaps it would be easier for them to, even if they would not be able to completely understand someone that has a personality very different from theirs, at least to be a bit more tolerant of them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that... Uh, I think that as a culture, we're, um, we're far too concerned with, you know, a narrow set of markers of how life should be lived. And I mean, that just goes, that's not just in personality, but, you know, think about the constant way people are assessed in, um, in, in schools and colleges and organisations. And, and think about the way that society's goals themselves are, qu are quite narrow. You know, we talk about maximising GDP and things like that. And I think... Um, I think different people have different values that that rather than sort of saying that some of those values are wrong or some of them are right, it's better to say to understand what they are and um, and then and try and understand what the kind of pros and cons or, or, or the attractions and, and disattractions of, of different kinds of things are. And then I suppose what the, the, the other thing that concerns me a lot and I think we do too much of is um, is medicalizing normal variation. I mean, the, the the proportion of people these days who are diagnosed with either a, either ADHD if they're um, uh, you know uh, boys or um, depression or anxiety of some kind is quite remarkably high. And uh, uh, you know, I think we really need to ask ourselves: is medicalizing that and sort of treating it pharmacologically? the right response to the existence of variation between people. Mm -hmm. And also there's the issue that perhaps some traits that because we have them, we find them positive, let's say, perhaps in the long run, if we follow our innate impulses or innate proclivities, let's say, perhaps we get into bad outcomes or something like that. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's very difficult to manage these things that have to do with personality, because sometimes even people with different personalities might give us advice that would be useful, at least in the long run, right? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Nettle, just before we go, would you like to tell people, apart from the books that I've already referred to in the introduction, what would be some of the best online resources if they want to get in touch with more of your work? Well, thanks for asking. So I have a book out very recently in November 2018 called Hanging On To The Edges, and this is an open access book. So if you just Google Hanging On To The Edges, uh, Daniel Nettle, you can get a copy for free or you can order paper copies. And there's, it talks about some of the topics we've mentioned today, but also many others. Uh, it, it's a collection of different uh, essays that, 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 that really spans the whole, the whole width of everything I've worked on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will be leaving links to all of your work, Dr. Nettle, in the description box of the interview. And again, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show and thank you a lot for taking the time to be here with us today. You're welcome. Nice to talk to you. Hi everybody, thank you so much for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Uh, otherwise, if you don't like Patreon, you can also go to PayPal or subscribe 
subscribe star all of the links are in the description box of the video and also on my channel uh, and apart from that you can also of course leave a like share the interview and hit the subscription button I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Jim Frank, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano and my first producer Isar Webe. Thank you for all.